Thank you everyone for joining us for Singray's webinar of the month with Vinnie Colucci. We are talking tonight about four keys for making great images. Um, and these I think are, are important keys for any image, whether it's film or digital or mirrorless. Um, these are things that translate to any variety of photography. By way of introduction to our presenter, um, Vinny Colucci is an award-winning photographer. He has been an active photographer since 1979 and a shooting professional since 1995. He has photographed North Carolina to the West Coast and North to the Canadian Rockies. Along with his wife, Annette, Vinny conducts nature and wildlife photography workshops throughout the year. He is an active outdoorsman and a member of Nikon's Professional Service and Wimberley Professional Service, Think Tank MindShift Affiliate and Technical Advisor, as well as a Stingray Filter Ambassador and Technical Advisor. His images have appeared in multiple publications, including Nature Photographer Magazine, Newburn Travel Magazine, Microwave Journal, Smoky Mountain Journal, and various other publications. He has also authored and co-authored multiple books, his speaking engagements have included Popular Photography Magazine, Recreational Equipment, REI, St. Augustine Photo and Birding Festival, Orlando Wetlands Festival, Crane Festival, and universities around the country. So welcome back, Vinny, and I will let you get going. Good evening, everyone. I appreciate you all sitting in and uh, spending part of the evening with us. I want to thank Michelle for... Uh, I'm seeing this and putting all the technical stuff together so it works. She makes me look good. Okay. And I want to thank Singray Filters um, for putting these webinars on every month to bring education um, to all you. Um, and not just about filters. We, we, we're really here to, to teach photography. And uh, I applaud Singray for that. And thank you for that. Tonight, we're going to be talking about four keys for making great images. And of course, right away, I have a technical glitch, and I don't know why. There we go. Um, four keys for making great images. The concept came up from uh, years and years ago when I was teaching with a dear friend, Bill Fortney, and he put a program on called Four Keys for Great Images. I love this program so much, I stole it. And uh, of course, with his permission. Uh, so I've been teaching this on and off throughout the last 20 years or so and uh, evolved it uh, a little bit and um, bringing you a brand new one tonight. Um, the concept of four keys uh, for making great, great images, it's not a high tech program tonight. It's almost a philosophy program. And really whether you're shooting a high end SLR or mirrorless camera, or your iPhone or point and shoot. These concepts are important for every image to be complete. And um, no matter how good you do technically with things like depth of field and composition and so forth, uh, these four elements that we'll talk about tonight and show tonight uh, are the ones that complete a pho photograph and make it worthy to uh, present to somebody else. So those four keys, appropriate light for a subject, and I have to apologize ahead of time. I have a little bit of a post-nasal drip cough. So I got my cough drops and something to drink over here. Um, so appropriate life for the subject, clearly defined subject, effective use of foreground and background, and the correct conditions to photograph um, in for your particular image that you're trying to create. Um, and again, it's not like you have two out of the four or three out of the four all four elements are key to every photograph. And um, as we go through the images and the camera settings that I've used to capture them and a little bit of the storytelling as uh, we go from beginning to end, keep in mind, look at the building block of the images, particularly ones that really look good to you. Do they incorporate these four keys? So we'll take um, each key one at a time uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the whole package in the conclusion of this. <clears throat> Again, it is a, a low tech approach to, to photography. Um, light as it stands, do we alter light to get our, our good light? Conditions, do we alter our conditions with things like filters? Uh, depth of field for foreground to background, 
to to sort of show what we see and what we want our viewer to see when we take our image home? And can we identify our subject within the image? Uh, that's what we're going to be looking at. And uh, even this image that I'm showing here, uh, a little bit of an action uh, image with snow flying, um, we could see that we we have good light um, and uh, the, uh, the use of foreground the background, uh, you know, background being blurry, so our image pops off, the foreground not stealing away from our image. These are the things we're going to look at one by one as we go through this. You'll see that each of these images, I, I don't think I missed any through the program. I do have my camera settings and the cameras that I use to do it. But before we get into uh, to this, basically the equipment that I use, I'm, I'm, I'm shooting with Nikon. Z mirrorless equipment with an assortment of lenses. Uh, obviously, uh, I do have an assortment of filters that I use. And um, and since 2000 and the end of 2018, um, I went 100% mirrorless. Uh, but I want to make this statement. None of that has to do with photography. My style of shooting hasn't really changed since, I would say, 1995 when I was shooting my, my F5 film camera. The concept... Uh, of all the gadgets and, and, and stuff to help us along in our new computerized cameras are excellent, but the basic principles of photography are the same. So I like to keep that in mind. And when I teach in the field, I try to make sure people understand how to be photographers first and then computer experts on that, on that camera second. Um, I do use a filter holder, um, especially for landscape photography. And my love for filter holds was at least so far has been the older style leaf filter holder. And the reason I like it, it has the interchangeable rings like a lot of filter holders do, but um, you can see there's a lot of screws around it. And, and that's because where it holds the filters, I'm able to loosen those screws. If I pick up a filter that has a gasket and it's a little too tight to slide in, I could loosen the screws, slide the filter in, tighten them back up. It gives me some variation. And uh, so uh, I actually go on eBay and look for the older style leaf filter holders and sort of stock up. So I have some to loan when I, when I do go out and teach workshops and people want to try a filter holder. But Singray sells filter holders. Uh, there's many places you can get different filter holders for the size filters that you're using. And, uh, but uh, in landscape particularly, filter holders uh, allow me to slow down, uh, allows me not to scratch up my filter by just holding it in front of the lens. And, and it allows me to be precision when I want to place a filter uh, in exact position, such as a graduated filter, um, graduated neutral density filter. Also, heated photography. This, even though um, VR and image stabilization has gotten so good, I do a lot of bird photography now, handheld, especially back in landscape world. Um, you can't beat a good tripod. Um, these are some of the tripods and ball heads that I use. There's many good ones out there. Um, get some really right stuff or upper end, but I shoot a lot and, and it's my profession. There's some really great mid price tripods now. Siri has them. Uh, um, there's three or four companies that produce really good mid price graphite tripods. And, uh, and there's also some really good ball heads out there. I try to pick a ball head that uses a universal uh, archer plate. Um, so I'm not stuck buying a specific plate just from one company. So whether I'm using a Kirk ball head or a really right stuff ball head, all my plates work. Um, all the plates on my wife are interchangeable with my stuff. So we could go back and forth, but no problem. But this is what we're here for. We're going to start with appropriate light for the subject. <clears throat> Listen, if we don't have light, we can't make a photograph. There's got to be some kind of light to record on your digital sensor or in the older days of film. Uh, some people are still shooting film now. Uh, you need to absorb light to create this image. Um, this image was um, created at Glacier National Park, Lake McDonald. Um, it was a long shutter speed, 10 seconds. You could see that that um, the golden hour um, after sunset is what I was after here. And uh, the group that was with me all got similar similar images, and uh, but again, the right light for the subject is really important. Notice I used the graduated filter because what I was trying to do, and, and this image just because of the way the slide is, had more water in front than what's shown here. 
The graduated filter, uh, and yeah, it has a name on We have the Vinnie Colucci extended grad filter is a longer graduation than most graduated filters. And it allows a balance of, of exposure for the foreground into the brighter light to make for a, uh, a smoother transition in from the bright light to, to the, the more shadowed area, in this case, the water. Um, I did use a polarizing filter because uh, particularly this sunset was behind me and to the left. So the polarizer did pop the contrast a little bit. And I have a tendency to leave a polarizer on all my lenses as my standard filter. And if it really is in the way or, or it's getting too dark to use a polarizer, I might switch out to like a Hilux filter because that still adds a little, little contrast and a little warmth. Um, but I have a tendency to keep a polarizer on every lens 90% um, of the time. So you'll see that a lot throughout these slides that in my list of filters, there's a polarizer on it. Picking the time of day for proper light will yield different results. You know, whether you're shooting a, you know, early morning light or warm afternoon light uh, will affect, the, you know, it will affect the image. Um, if I shoot at three o'clock versus shooting at five o'clock or if I get up at 4 a.m. and wait for the light to come up for a sunrise, um, the light's going to change and it's going to constantly change and you keep shooting and you're going to get two or three different looks at the same subject. Um, so pick the time of day uh, based on your own experiences and the locations you're at. Um, and then you'll get, uh, you'll get two or three different types of photographs. But again, all about light. Here, this is Sparks Lane, Cades Cove on the uh, Tennessee side of the Smoky Mountains. Uh, if you look at the left, this is a classic shot in, in the morning. The sun's coming up to the far left. And uh, so we are going to alter the light a little bit because we use the polarizer. Why? Because as the light strikes the trees when it you know, breaks over the horizon, the polarizer takes a lot of shine off the trees and pops the color, pops the contrast. Uh, but we had to start with good light. If this was an overcast day, I couldn't do this. Well, on another trip, I went back and I went back to Sparks Lane on the far right. Um, I think it was a, you know, a, a trip several months later. Um, I was going through Sparks Lane. It was sort of the middle of the day. It was like two o'clock, not the best time to do a landscape shot. So I changed the light again. I took a, an I-Ray 830, you know, nanometer infrared filter and, um, did this exposure. So I, I used the, the harsher bright light to my advantage because that particular filter uh, yields long, long exposure times. As you can see here, this was five minutes um, at F8, uh, which gave me those nice wispy clouds up above. Um, and we're going to talk about conditions later, but we'll mention it now. You can't do this on a windy day because then everything would be too blurred. Uh, but if it's just a little breezy or if it's nice and calm, you could pull this off with a long five minute exposure or a longer, depending on how your sensor reacts with an infrared filter. Late afternoon light, this is uh, uh, Jordan Lake Dam uh, out in North Carolina. This time of year, actually, you know, between January and the end of February, this you go to the dam, there's usually no less than 12 to 18 eagles up in a tree ready to fish. And uh, not the prettiest water coming off the dam, but in the late afternoon when the sun's coming down over my right shoulder, if you're facing this eagle, um, you get this warm um, look to the eagle. And as they're going down to the water, we have this, this nice grass line along the top of a hill that makes a nice background. So as we look at our subject and how it enters into the light, um, Again, that's what creates the light necessary for making this image. On a gray overcast day, eh, not such an impactful Im image, unless you want to shoot it in black and white. Uh, I used uh, a Hilux filter here because it was getting late. Um, the sun was almost directly over my, my right shoulder, so polarization didn't have a big effect. But the Hilux filter, which is really just a clear UV filter, adds a little warmth and adds a little contrast pop. It's the only clear filter I ever use because it adds those two elements, uh, which are missing in a lot of other uh, clear filters. Also makes a really good protection filter if you don't want a polarizer on it 
on every lens you could stick a less expensive Hilux on there. Early morning, um, one of the things about early morning shooting is you got to get up. I'm getting a little older. Sometimes I don't like to get up so much. Uh, but yeah, there's being someplace before sunrise, waiting for the light to come up. And as a, this was in the Everglades, I'm waiting for the light to come up and it's coming up slowly. And this uh, great blue herring was just pruning itself and cleaning itself by the water. And, uh, and then the light hit it on, on, on the right side and, and it almost exploded in my face. So the light here uh, is what makes this work. And, and the light in the background on, on the water um, is nice and even. So it gives me a nice palette that, that my subject pops off of. Again, I used a, a polarizing filter on this and, uh, and that's to take any of the reflections and, and sheen. Or, now, a lot of people say in wildlife, you still use a polarizing filter? Yeah, whether it's grizzly bears or whether it's egrets or eagles. If I have an opportunity to polarize in a direction where my subjects might be, I do, because it also brings out detail in the feathers. It, it actually helps tame the scattered light, and it gives you an image, an appearance of being sharper. And uh, so, yeah, I, I try to polarize whenever I can. Now, sometimes you can't. Things happen too quick and you don't have a chance to polarize. So the worst that can happen is you shoot it the way it is. Uh, telephoto lens compressed. That's why we have that soft Im image in the background. And also, you know, this was an F4 lens, which also gives me a nice bokeh in the background um, to get get that, that smooth color palette. Uh, but it still all starts with great light. So we want to look for great light. Glacier National Park. This is a mini glacier. Um, Got to be there early, five in the morning, waiting for the sun to come up. And then right after the sun gets up above the horizon, and starts to light these mountains. Um, you get this great light off the top of the, the you know, the, the, the stonework. It, just great light on the subject, makes the subject. Uh, I used a polarizing filter um, that helped take some of the sheen off the water and I used a two-stop graduated filter just a, a regular grad um, on a little bit of a diagonal from the right down just to darken where that reddish rock was and and blended into the rest of the uh, foreground but again you have to be there for the light did um, you research these locations ahead of time to find out you know what side of the mountain you want to be standing on etc yeah if you haven't been there before um you need to research it and, and with uh, with all this information on the internet <clears throat> you could google glacier national park best locations for photographs and, and times and you'll get that information uh, before time but it, it takes a lot of experience uh myself bill fortney and tony sweet did a, a big event in charlotte north carolina some years back and we all did a presentation and we did a, a, a question and answer, sit on a stool, people asking us questions. And uh, one of the questions that came up is, how do you guys get so many great images? And you're in those locations all the time. And Bill Fortney actually took that one question. He said, send this. You're not going to like what I say. Go to every national park over 20 years, three, four, five times, <laughs> and you'll get a handful of good images. It's not like every time a pro goes out, they come back with 2,000 great images, right. um, just like people that are non-professional. And I don't believe in amateur. Everybody out there has value in their photography. But yeah, um, sometimes it's experience. Sometimes it's talking to locals. You know, when I was in Glacier, um, on the on the east side of Glacier National Park, when I first started to teach in Glacier, I think it was 2006. Um, I taught an event there with Bill Fortney and Scott Kelby. And um, one of the things I did in preparing for the event, because I got there early, um, was stop and talk to the rangers. I stopped and talked on the Indian reservation to some of the residents there because they know that park inside and out. And they made some really great, great suggestions to bring the groups to. Uh, but as, as I do those events and we find great things to bring our groups to, I make notes. So... If I'm going to Glacier National Park, uh, I have a digital file on my computer that says images I've taken in Glacier National Park. And I can look at the metadata and know the settings so I could get a head start on, 
on getting people set up and and what they need to do to get close to a great image because when the sun comes up this this light lasts all of five minutes and it's gone so you really need to be prepared and one of the advantages we're going with a leader that's been there um is that they know those uh settings that they've used before to get an image like this so yeah research is key i, sp I spend a lot of time if i haven't gone someplace even if i've been there before if i haven't been there in a while i'm spending hours and hours researching because i want to it's a lot of money for me to go to so it's uh i want to make uh, my time there worthwhile clearly defined subject well what do we mean by that one of the things i have found um in um taking people around and and doing critiques at the end of my workshops or doing presentations on my own and watching other instructors do presentations uh and then i sit back and watch other folks do presentations like at camera clubs and so forth what I find one of the big mistakes are is that they try to put too many subjects into an image or it's too cluttered to the point where you can't really pick out what the person was thinking about. What's the subject? Is it is it the waterfall? Is it the waterfall uh, and that beautiful set of trees? To the, you have to be clear when you photograph. So if somebody looks at your image and says oh yeah that's what he's trying to show and the rest of it is supporting um in the case of here with with this mama bear and and and, and the uh, adolescent coming up behind her um again great light we're off the subject of light but watch these building blocks as we go through here great light clearly defined the face of the bear is clear even the uh cub i i, I probably took 25 30 shots and there's multiple ones where or, you know the uh the the younger cub the, the younger younger bear his face was down in the weeds he was forward you had to get a shot where both faces were clear but the baby the, the younger bear is really the supporting um uh, subject the mama bear is the main subject and uh, of course the uh the weeds uh, you know in the field they're walking through is just the environment so but the subject has to be clear and if it takes you more then a few words to explain your photograph, then you didn't do a great job. It's got to tell a story pretty much on its own. Um, we know what this story is. You know, just you could imagine a story, what's happening here. Uh, even though both of these cougars were up in a tree sitting, for what seemed like forever, but it was really only about eight, eight minutes or so. Um, with all that, you know, um, tree foliage around them, they were sort of buried. And it wasn't until this mama took a leap and created a line to bring you back to the baby that otherwise the baby would just disappear into the tree line. Um, so you need that clearly defined subject. The other 150 shots I have of, of her sitting up there with the baby were cool, but they sort of disappeared into, into the trees in the background. So it wasn't an image I was willing to present, but when she leaped in, and, and I was lucky enough, um, Another thing Bill Fortney once said, the more you shoot, the luckier you get. Here you go. Um, that created the clearly defined subject and, and, and her baby became, became the supporting subject. And of course, the trees around it, uh, you know, surrounding, that's what the environment we're in now. And that's what tells the whole story. But that clearly defined subject. Also, I'm going to keep going back to the building block. Great light on the mom particularly. Well, I think I wanted to make a point though uh, back here. Was it here? No. Yeah, polarizing filter. When you're sitting looking at this, I can't polarize when action's happening. But if I know I'm working with a bird or I'm working with a mammal, any wildlife, I polarize before as I set up to start my patients waiting. I polarize that direction because I knew if anything happened, it would be in that direction. And then I forget about the polarizer after that point. So yeah, you again. You, you can't wait for the action to polarize or you're going to miss the shot. Sometimes you have to just take a chance because of experience and polarize in the, in the direction you think your subjects are going to move in. Sometimes, especially, obviously, I'm, I'm showing more wildlife here because I'm probably more of a wildlife photographer. Um, 
this the little cabin on the left was in the Smoky Mountains. On the right, I was in Montana with this wolf in, in the uh, in the um, in the tree line. Um, they're going to be buried in here. You have to look for opportunities for for their eyes to be clear, so you could get a shot. But you could also use the environment around them to tell the story. Don't forget that. You know, this wolf, for example, coming up behind the trees. You know, uh, I took shots, but they weren't great because the trees were blocking until it passed through the trees. It almost looks like it was jailed there. The little cub, uh, the only thing that made me nervous with that, because guess where mama was? Mama was down below. Uh, and uh, so I was careful uh, keeping my distance and and shooting from afar. But yeah, um, I was waiting for that moment when the subject is clearly defined and that's the image you want to show and again you can see i used a polarizer gee i think i use a polarizer a lot michelle i think you do so when you're getting action shots like this how many how many times do you click that button to get these images uh, that's a great question i do another program maybe i'll do it for singer i do a program on on how i shoot you know the settings but the real secret here is and I've done this since my F5 days, um, which was a film camera back in the 90s. Um, I set my camera on continuous firing. I set it on continuous autofocus. I leave it on dynamic um, autofocus. I love Nikon's dynamic autofocus. And it's gotten better and better and better over the years. Even on my Z9, it is incredible. Uh, when I start using some of the little fancy things like eye detection, blah, 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 I, I don't use that. I use basic photography. I shoot in short bursts. Now, if I'm shooting my Z6 II, it shoots at 12 frames a second. So if I do a short burst, I'm probably picking up about eight frames for a short burst. And, um, my Z9 shoots at 20 raw images a second. It is fast. So I shoot a short burst. I got a lot of images. I've got 20 images uh, of the same thing. But... Uh, uh, Roland, um, forgot his name. Oh man, great uh, landscape photographer. He's done some filters for Sing Rays before he passed away years and years ago. Um, he was doing a workshop and he was doing a macro setup and he was shooting film and he set up and he unloaded 36 exposures all on a, sta a stationary uh, macro plant. And the question was, why did you shoot? And you didn't change anything. You, you picked up your cable release. You fired 36 exposures because that's what was on a roll of film. And um, and you didn't change anything. And he said, yeah, but one of those images are going to be sharper than the rest. As your mechanical camera settles and and environment around you settles, like people walking and, and vibrations in the ground, one of those images will be... Um, just a little bit sharper. So I've always shot in short bursts. And we have a couple of people in the audience that know that story, and it's Galen Rowell. Yeah, Galen Rowell. That's it. I, I went brain dead. That's what happens, Michelle, when you start getting older like me. Uh, um, and 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 that's a famous thing that he did. And uh, the, the, the beauty of that is that I took away from when I read about that was shooting in bursts gives you your best opportunity to get the perfect image. But later what I found is, cause I do a lot of bird photography, that'll do a lot of fast moving mammal photography and slow moving mammal photography. Uh, shooting in short bursts sometimes gets me a facial expression, even a bird flying by, an eagle flying by, gets me a, a, um, a facial expression. I wouldn't have even noticed it happened so quick. So I might have 10 images of the same thing or bird going by, barely moving, you know, from left to right, and I have 20 images of that, one of them, the bird looked and noticed me. I didn't know he noticed me. Well, looked down and noticed a fish. Now that's the keeper. And I wouldn't have got that trying to shoot sing a single shot. I would have had a shoot and burst to get that. So it's a little bit of luck, but with a good panning technique, that luck starts to repeat itself over and over and over again. Love alligators. Um, my wife Annette, you know, I had gotten re I had gotten remarried a uh, little uh, little over eleven years ago, 
That's the only thing she promised. I used to do a lot of gator shots in the Everglades in Orlando wetlands. And, you know, I had no problem getting in the water to get an, a closer to eye level shot with a gator. So she pro made me promise not to do that so much anymore. Um, at least not without letting her to raise my life insurance, at least while I was doing that. So she could get a prize at the end if I made a mistake. But yeah, I, I love alligators. But I have to wait. Look, we talked about light, building block, light, clearly defined. The back alligator, intentionally, I shot this a little shallow depth of field. I wanted that to blur out a little bit, but I wanted enough in there so you knew it was an alligator. My main subject is this one in the front. Eye is sharp, great light coming through its mouth. And um, yeah, a polarizing filter took a lot of the water reflections out. And uh, and that was all done. It was all polarized before anything happened with the gator. But you got to wait it out. You, you can't photograph particularly wildlife like you walking through a zoo. You have to wait it out. And if you don't get the shot, that's OK. You heard the birds. You got to chill out. We're out there because we're in love with nature. And if we get a photograph to take home, we're lucky. So um, when my whole approach changed to that, um, I started getting better images instead of trying to go out to get the image that looks like somebody else's image. Now I get the images that God presented to me. I do shoot in zoos and, 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 and some game farm work, but I, I do uh, workshops at different zoos. Uh, Riverbank Zoo in Columbia, South Carolina is a favorite zoo because their tigers um, are in a really natural setting. From a photography point of view, I can get shots like this. And again, we have to we have to wait for the eye of the tiger. Uh, we have to wait for sometimes for them to move into the clear. And it's not uncommon for me to go spend an hour and a half at a zoo. Uh, the North Carolina Zoo is 40 minutes from my house. Nikon sends me a new lens to test. I'm in the car. If I'm home working in the office, I'm in the car going to test the lens at the North Carolina Zoo. And... Um, but when I go, I pick a subject. Maybe it's lions. In this case, it was tigers. Sometimes it's the giraffes or the rhinos or the elephants. And that's what I work. I don't walk through the zoo like a tourist. I pick a subject and I work it. And I wait for it to be clearly defined uh, so I could create an image. Meanwhile, in between, um, when I don't have an image, people walking through, if they need help with their cameras, I get to help them with their cameras. So uh, it's still a benefit. So, yeah, just wait for that clearly defined and wait for great light. Wait for great light. And someone from the audience said, I love the comment. I get the pictures that God presents to me. Oh, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. Uh, somebody asked me why I do all this. Uh, I was a design engineer for a long time. Um, I used to design radar components for the military. I worked on Space Shuttle, F-18, Aegis, AWACS, those that might have some knowledge of those things, they, they know that's pretty complex. You know, lots of calculations, and I, I have a background in engineering and a background in, uh, in physics. Um, but now I do photography, and I'm not that type of engineer anymore. And people say, why? Well, I learned how to make less money by being a professional photographer than I used to make. Not about the money. To me, it's about being out there and bringing back an image of God's creation. You know, so I'm not going to turn this into that direction, but that's why I do this. I want somebody to see my image and want to go see it for themselves. And if my image does that, it did a good job. Here, we talk about clearly defined subjects. I spent about an hour, hour and a half with this bobcat in Merritt Island. He was up in a tree <coughs> and he was buried in the back. All I could see is fur. And I stayed and stayed and he moved a little bit forward. And I finally got that top shot with a big leaf in front of his head. Well, then I moved my feet. And uh, one of the best camera adjustments is to move your feet and get a better composition. But it had some, you know, it was at the end of the day, there was some great light on her. Um, and then her head came into the clear. Now, a lot of times you would say, well, you got the shot. And, and she, she stayed there, you know, and the head was in clear. But how many shots could you get of that? Uh, but I waited and waited and waited. And, uh, and by the way, see, I used the polarizer. Um, it took the sheen off 
the leaves, which would have been distracting from the cat. If the, you know, if I had reflections and stuff on those leaves. So I had an opportunity to polarize and I took it, but I waited and waited and waited. And right before I was ready to give up, I got this one. And that's the winner. But I need, but I needed to be patient. I needed to wait. And I needed to wait for her to be clearly defined. I couldn't just say, wow, I saw a bobcat and I took pictures and she was buried way in the back. Uh, this was my Z9. Um, shot at about one eight hundredth of a second. This was handheld. This was handheld with my five hundred, uh, five six actually PF, and I had you know a polarizer on it. Um, but you have to give it time um, to to do. Even here, this, with this the, um, when you're using a long telephoto lens, mm -hmm. do you use a polarizer, and is it mounted in the rear filter holder of the lens? When I'm using the larger lenses that I used to use when I was shooting SLRs, like my 600 f4, my my 400 28, yeah, that polarizer was mounted in the rear. The lens I'm using with my mirrorless is a 500 PF right now, um, and uh, uh, the 500 PF is very hand holdable. But I do occasionally put that on the Wembley head in the gimbal, uh, especially if I'm sitting on waiting long periods of time. When I was um, in Glacier not too long ago photographing moose out in the pond. Um, I did have it on uh, on, a, on a gimbal head just because I didn't want to hold it all that time. But the VR is so good in the Z9 and, and in the lenses and, and the new Canon systems, the new Sony systems that shooting handheld, uh, my rule is this, I'm shooting a 500 millimeter lens. I need to be someplace at or above one 500th of a second. Um, don't panic. I, I had a couple of people say, well, I'm going to shoot at one two thousandth of a second. And then as the light went down, they're shooting an ISO 12,000. 12, and if images get a little, no matter how good we get, they're obviously going to be a little more grainy. You don't need to shoot that fast. You need to develop a technique and uh, for either holding it you know, still or putting it back on a tripod. I'm able to hold it pretty still. Uh, a lens with VR or the uh, five-axis VR in my Z9, you know, I, I could hold a 200 millimeter lens down to a 30th of a second and get sharp images. Now, I don't try to do that, but if I have to, I will. Um, this image I was pointing out that sometimes there's two subjects, this one, the tree, and as, along with the blue herring, but there's great light. Uh, there's great light in the background. Um, the 500 PF compressed the background well enough where it turned into a, a palette. Uh, I used a polarizing filter because the light was coming from the right, uh, and it really popped uh, the light around, you know, the the beak as well as on the tree. You can see the detail, um, but it's clearly defined. You know that the main subject is really the bird, even though the tree is bigger because of the separation. And uh, so you need to you need to be aware of all that. Using foreground. And background, my wife told, this is my older granddaughter and she likes to go shooting sometimes. We're in Kate's Cove, more of a fun trip, but she's doing photography, she was shooting this sunset. And uh, so I photographed her photographing the sunset. But what I like about it for this program, we talk about foreground and background, that fence line, as well as where she set up, forms a leading line. So I'm using the foreground to the background as even though she's a main subject and the sun in a starburst is is the uh, second subject, that foreground to background thing um, is being used effectively to bring you into the scene. You could almost feel yourself walking along that road, and that's what I wanted to to do here. Uh, I did use a, uh, my Vinnie Colucci extended grad, um, and uh, to, you know, which is dark on top and graduates longer than a standard grad into the foreground. So I could keep her exposed, even though she was obviously backlit, you could see the rim lighting around her. And I used a little tone mapping, you know, basically I pulled up some shadows and stuff. You could tell it almost has that artistic look. Uh, but yeah, the foreground, the background. And by the way, I, I used F22. <clears throat> and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. F22, because that's what helped creates the sunburst. Otherwise, typically in a landscape, I never go past F-16. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Like, yeah. 
using foreground to background. Excuse me one minute. Using foreground to background here. I wanted to create the foreground to background to lead you into the scene. This is, uh, this is the fort down in St. Augustine. And uh, um, to do this, uh, I needed a flow almost, it's almost turns into a, an S turn from the left corner. Look at the great light, first building block. The subject is the fort, clearly defined. There's lots of little supporting subjects around it. Um, and I'm using the foreground, the background to bring you into the scene. And this is how I set it up. You can see the camera settings. When you're doing a landscape and you need everything in focus, the way a camera physics works, probably promise not to get more technical than what you're seeing here, is that if you focus about a third up the scene, if it was vertical, same thing, third up the scene, a third in front at F16, between F11 and F16, and a third be behind will be in focus. So I focus somewhere along that brick layer, and at F16, everything is sharp. Um, that being said, when do you use F22? Even though you increase the depth of field going to F22 and F32, our lens starts to degrade. Our lens are typically sharper somewhere around F8. As we stop down to F16 to get this big depth of field for landscapes, it starts to deteriorate, but the depth of field grows so much, it you can tolerate the, the deterioration. If you get past F22, it starts to fall off. The images actually get a little softer. So my magic number is at F16. About a third up into the scene, one third in front, two thirds behind, perfectly in focus. This is just another example using a foreground to background effectively. This was, sun had gone down. This is over uh, Pamaco Sound. Um, and uh, I used the, the silhouette of the darkness in the foreground to make you feel like you had, you had to walk down this boardwalk to get out to uh, the water to see all that beautiful light back there. Foreground to background. In this case, the foreground was the shadows of the clouds. And I used the grass line as a silhouette. Uh, you can see I used a three-stop grad <clears throat> because it was a little bright up in the sky and I wanted to balance it with the foreground. Um, in this case, the polarizer didn't have an effect because the sun had just gone down behind those back trees, but the polarizer almost acted like an ND filter, which helped chill that water out and smooth that water out just a little bit. Um, but the foreground, the background, the light, it's clearly defined. It's not cluttered. These are the building blocks we're talking about to make a great image. Top image up on the Smokies. I love the leading line. I've been photographing that barn up by Grandfather Mountain in North Carolina probably since 1994. And I, I've shot this with an, <clears throat> a film X-Pan, um, which was a panoramic camera. I've shot it with digital. This was with my uh, Z9 um, last fall was this past fall and my wife and i were up scouting for a workshop and photographing but foreground to background you see where the fence comes out of the corner um that's a leading line it makes you feel like you need to walk that fence to get to the barn you want to bring people into your scene foreground to background <clears throat> down below down below uh where we had this nice line in price lake of color it was the color palette that caught my eye, but it came from left to right. It was a nice foreground to background. And uh, what we did there, remember I talked about a third up, just like on the fence, about a third up, I focused there, F16, boom. Down below, it was hard to focus a third up because it was hard to lock on focus on reflective um reflective trees in the water. So I did cheat a little bit and I found something up in that left-hand corner that was a little higher than a third, but I didn't care because I knew that the color palette in the water was gonna be not sharp anyways. It needed to be a color palette, uh, but that's basically how I set that one up. Uh, polarizing filter um, is always on my lens. So, you know, it helps slow the shutter speed down, uh, but I used the three-stop ND filter to help tame the sky into the foreground.
foreground to background, sometimes you eliminate the foreground. In this case, I do this a lot with wildlife. I drop the background out because I'll shoot wide open. In this case, it was a 70 to 200, 28 shot at 28. Uh, background turned to a nice color palette. This was a zoo shot. This was at Columbia Zoo, actually, I think. And um, the telephoto lens compresses. So I'm not using a foreground at all. I got rid of it, but I'm using the background effectively here. You get to make that choice as a photographer. Same thing here, you know, foreground, the background being used. Um, I'm keeping an eye on some time here, so I know I got to pick it up a little bit. I get into my stories, and it's like, I'm sorry. Um, Looking Glass Falls, now we're talking about conditions. You know, we talked about, oh, I'm sorry, what backwards? Conditions have to be right for the subject. Like here, it had to be a cold day. I wanted to show cold. So, um, Going out, if you wanted to photograph flags, you can't go out on a calm day. They're all hanging, you know, limp. You got to go out on a windy day so the flag is sticking out. Um, what conditions do we have here? We're picking conditions. This was in Montana. Uh, we were photographing at a working ranch and uh, they ran these horses. And the conditions are that it's snowing out. Uh, they're kicking up snow. Can't, couldn't do this in the middle of summer and get that image. So you got to pick the conditions that you want or well, alter the conditions. This was a sunrise shot after sunrise on a, on a beach. We put some shells out there and used, uh, a, in this case, a, a Singray more slow five stop to get a really slow shutter speed. So we changed the conditions a little bit to get that milky wave action. Um, but again, we needed good light, early morning light, you know, the whole thing. Subjects clearly defined. We even have movement in our, in our, uh, uh, subject now we have this moving water and we can recognize motion in this case we change the conditions with filters but we need to know the conditions we need early morning fog in Catalucci, you know you can't get this at four in the afternoon you can get great light four in the afternoon but you, this you have to go there before sunrise let the mist start to rise you know um another condition snow by the way um when you're shooting, when, when particularly when I'm shooting in snow, I always leave my uh, white balance set to cloudy. I, I'll leave it set to cloudy anyway. I like that warm look, but it takes that blue out uh, that sometimes you get when you shoot snow scenes. So you might want to, if you're the type of person that likes to do auto white balance, put it on a specific white balance. Try shooting wildlife and nature with a cloudy white balance, even in the sunshine, because it'll give you a little extra warmth. But when we look for conditions like calm weather and great light, even at night, the moonlight coming through the uh, the clouds gave me great light. Um, polarizing even at night here, controlled reflections in the water. So um, the, one of the conditions that are important. So as we come into conclusion and we look at our images, critique yourself. Uh, did our image uh, include all four keys? You know, this is in Yellowstone, you know, bison. Most dangerous animal in bison in Yellowstone is not the grizzly bear. It's not the moose. It's these guys. Uh, they'll run you down in a heartbeat. Um, is there good light? Is the subject clearly defined? Do we have um, do we have foreground and background helping us? And again, the conditions have to be right to get this smooth wall. It's got to be calm. We got to look at these. Does our image tell a story? There's something happening um, that you could create a story in your mind to show somebody. Um, the four keys are always changing because light changes. You know, sometimes conditions change. You got to keep this all in mind as you're going for your image. Make sure your, your image makes your viewer want to go see it for themselves that it captivates your viewer, but make sure it has all four elements. Great light, clearly defined, foreground to background uh, working for you and, and that you're using the right conditions. In this, this case, a nice sunny afternoon in the Smokies. Then you know your image did a good job. Lastly, think out of the box. Some of those extra computer features like multiple exposure and all that stuff, experiment with them. This was the Sequoia trees in California. Um, I got bored taking tree shots, so I created something out of the box. Uh, have fun. Stay safe.
and uh, we have a little time to spare for more questions if there is any. Awesome. I actually love that photo of the bison from Yellowstone. It reminds me when I went to Yellowstone, I think I had a half a memory card full of bison picture. It was almost like a joke amongst the family, like not another bison photo. But at the end of the trip, I had like two or three really good bison photos. I framed one. I put one on a blanket. Like they were really, those were good images. And I, I think it was worth half a memory card to get there. Mm -hmm. I love photo. I, I, just one quick story. I was photographing with. Um, another instructor and we were out scouting what i typically do if i'm running a photography event i'm there a couple of days before for one to get my images because i don't shoot that much when i'm teaching because that's not what you paid me to do you paid me to teach you um but we're out scouting to find those locations before the group showed up and uh, i'm photographing a bison with a wide angle lens and she um and she's a dear actually she's my sister-in-law now that's how i met Annette. Uh, <laughs> She used to teach with me. Uh, her name is Melissa Southern. And uh, she's standing on the roof of the car because I didn't realize how close the bison was getting to me with the super wide angle lens. And she's yelling at me, get in the car, get in the car. And I'm <laughs> snapping away, snapping away. And I pulled my head up and I never get close to wildlife on purposely, but sometimes they come upon you. Uh, and I pulled my head up and it felt like I was almost nose to nose. So I backed away carefully and got in the car. <laughs> Yeah, bisons are the most dangerous animals in Yellowstone. So we have a couple of questions um, from the chat. We didn't talk a lot about grads, but um, someone said it's difficult to use an ND grad in mirrorless. Can you talk about your technique for using graduated ND filters? Okay, um, graduated ND filters with my Z6. I started with the Z7, Z6, and I'm shooting Z6 too and a Z9, but they're all mirrorless. I haven't had a problem um using them once I develop patience. And I think what they're talking about is when you look through, and I don't, I don't, unless I'm doing something special like teaching and showing, I don't use the monitor to look at my images because the light changes everything, unless I'm put a big blanket over my head. But I do look at stuff in the viewfinder. I look through my viewfinder just like I did with my SLRs. The problem is most mirrorless cameras, there's a delay. So when you polarize, you got to wait a little bit to see what happens. That's why I like to pre-polarize, like this shot of this deer running across this little island that was out in the water. I've already polarized that direction, and he ran into my scene. So you have to be a little patient. And I know with my Z6, there was a quite a bit of a delay when I, let's say, used a grad filter, and I inched it down just a little at a time. I'd have to wait. CD effect, and then CD effect, and then CD effect. As I've gotten the Z6 II, big improvement on that. The Z9, it's almost like I'm shooting an SLR. I, I see the effect right away. And, um, and I just treat it like an SLR now. Now, I don't know. I have had some people with other manufacturer cameras, the earlier ones. I'm sure the new Canons and Sony's uh, or just up there with the Z62 and, or might even exceed the Z62 and, and the Z9. Um, I just get to play with those cameras when I'm on a workshop and people bring them. Uh, I have a tendency to collect more Nikon people because of my background in Nikon, but I do get Canon shooters and I do get Sony shooters and I get Fuji shooters. And um, that little delay is is what I think this person's talking about. So you got to be patient and let that delay happen. And when you're doing a sunrise or if you're doing any type of scenic, you have time for that delay. And uh, I leave my histogram on, my live histogram in the viewfinder. So as it's happening, as I'm pulling that filter down in front of the lens, I could keep a right eye on that histogram to make sure I'm not blowing something out uh, or underexposing something. Because unlike unlike uh, what people think. I do shoot sometimes a little underexposed, uh, but if you go too far underexposed, when you brighten things up in software, then you're going to get a lot of digital noise. So you really want your exposures right. Uh, that's really key to coming home with some good images also. So I don't know if that helps, but my technique was to wait. Um, I, f I used to shoot a Fuji X-T1 for a while, uh, just when Nikon didn't have mirrorless and I found that the delay was a long time compared to today's cameras. 
And, you know, I'm sure the X, XT3 and 4 are, are much better than my XT1 was. But yeah, you're going to have to watch that effect carefully in your viewfinder. Um, in your dual photos in color and infrared at Case Cove, did you use a fully converted camera for both images? Nope. The color photo was just a straight camera. That was just a normal image <clears throat> using uh, whatever filters I used back there. Let's see if we go find that. And the infrared image, infrared image that we looked at, it's just this is slow the way it does it. Oh, I missed it. There we go. There we go in, should be coming up. Um, the infrared image was uh, the Singray iRay 830 filter. Um, the 830 infrared filter, you take a standard camera and you put that filter in front and, um, and there's techniques to it. So I'm simplifying it. And you do no conversion to the camera. The disadvantage with that filter, and I love the black and white look of what that filter does, is it's going to be a long exposure. Anyways, between five minutes and eight minutes long at F8, depending on how your particular sensor reacts. With the Nikon cameras, if somebody said, I got this Nikon, it doesn't matter what it is. Uh, every single time I just say, start at F8, uh, ISO 800 or 1000, somewhere's in there, five minute exposure, and they almost nail that exposure every time. That's just the Nikon. Now, it's a little different for Canon sensors, but not much different. So you might, it might be a little longer, a little less. So you got to experiment a little bit. But my settings, which are now my little setup settings, I think now come with the instruction set for the infrared 830 filter when uh, Singray sends them out. You don't have to do any conversion at all, none whatsoever. On the left, that was um, polarizing filter. Um, and I shot this in Vivid. I wanted to see how Vivid would look. Uh, I typically shoot in standard. I shot it in vivid because I wanted to simulate like when I shot uh, Velveeta back in film days, which really gave you this, this type of look, this really poppy look. And I happen to like it um, to get that look. But no, all I used was polarizing filter and a regular camera. None of my cameras are converted. I might convert, I might buy a used Z6 or something, convert it um, just to have one. But no, this is all done with filters. Um, and I think this might be the last one. How often and under what conditions do you use the Wimberley? Well, before, before the VR got so great within the last five to seven years, I used the Wimberley head every time I was doing any type of large telephoto work. Um, I probably used my tripod and head, either the ball head or the Wimberley head, 95% of the time. Now I'm probably shooting on a tripod for all my landscapes, but my wildlife is probably 50-50, and it really depends on, on birds in flight. I strictly handhold now. It's just easier to track them. I've gotten good enough to get the, get the autofocus bead on the bird, shoot a short burst, and if I shoot 10 images, eight of them are sharp, seven of them are sharp. I might lose one or two or three where I missed getting the autofocus soon. But let me give you a, let me give you a trick for birds. Even if I had a 5.6 or an F4 lens or a 2.8 lens, I don't shoot wide open for birds in flight because you can't get the sensor on the eye of the bird. You can't do that with an eagle flying by at 30 miles an hour to pick up a fish. So you have to aim for the body. So I shoot the old engineer in me doesn't allow me to go to F8. I shoot at 7.1. My aperture set to 7.1 because if I can get the back shoulder of the wing or the body of the bird, the depth of field will pull the sharpness in on the head of the bird. So then I only have to worry about a bird in flight, getting the autofocus sensor on the bird. Once I fire with dynamic autofocus, the camera does a great job. Even if I come off at a focus for a split second, there's 500 other sensors that maintain that focus uh, long enough that it gives me a chance to catch up with the bird again. The trick is when you shoot the burst, whether it's a short or a longer burst, don't lift your finger off the shutter and start over again because you have to reacquire. When you start the burst, let the camera dynamic autofocus. Uh, it's uh, um, 
different manufacturers use different terms, uh, but the uh, let it do its job and you'll have less throwaways. As soon as you release the shutter, then the camera has to reacquire all over again. You're going to get more misses. And that's whether if I'm on the Wembley head or hand holding. Okay, I think that's it for questions. Okay. Um, I do invite you to check out Vinny's website. He is listed as one of our ambassadors on the Singray website, so easy to find that way. I also, just a personal note, I would recommend finding him on Facebook. He and his wife will go out and often shoot the same subject matter, and they'll do these he saw, she saw photo posts, and it'll be the same subject matter, but two completely different takes, and I find those those particular posts are, are are very inspirational to me anyway. Well, so. we're actually designing a, hopefully a webinar for Singray that's just that. Uh, he said, she said, just to show that. And uh, hopefully- There's that, no right or wrong image. I love that. Yeah, well, she's always right. <laughs> and that's what makes you a good husband. Well, so. <laughs> I get the last word and you know what it is? Yes, dear. <laughs> and that's it. So I do want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Thank you, Vinny, for joining us and sharing your expertise. Um, we'll get this recording out shortly. Um, and again, any any final words, Vinny? Or yeah, uh, my you know my um, my um, email has been on here, and you get my email off the website. If you have questions, don't hesitate to send me an email. I'm not going to send you an invoice to give you an answer if I don't know it. I will find out or find somebody that could help you. I don't want anybody being stagnated in their photography because they're afraid to ask what they think is a stupid question. There are no stupid questions. Um, please, you know, and even if you needed to set up a time where we have to chat on the phone, I get emails every week where I'm sitting, help people set up their camera settings so they can get certain type of shots. So don't hesitate to reach out to me. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody, and have a great night. Good night.